Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you at home, we have a very full house here at the Log Cabin, and it's nice to see this many faces. Um, my name is Karen McNeil. I'm the director of Yarmouth Community Services. We also do parks and recreation. We maintain a lot of the uh, publicly owned spaces that are on Cousins Island. So um, for some reason, deer fell into our office, and uh, we're now going to be doing our best to bring the community get together for this conversation with some professionals from our state who have done this in various um, areas and communities in our, in our area and region. Um, to my immediate left or your right from me is um, Evan Franklin, our current regional um, game warden. Um, next to him is Scott Lindsay. He is the wildlife biologist whose face you saw in all the ads that we posted out there regarding tonight. Sorry. <laughs> I stole it from the website somewhere. Um, and then Sean Campbell is also um, a wildlife biologist for the state. Am I saying that right? All right. So we hit it. I'm going to pass the mic. Um, there is a notepad if you came in either from the front door or if you came in really early and I didn't catch you. Um, there's a notepad. It looks like we've already flipped a couple pages. If you want to add your email address, if there's any information that we want to push out from tonight, I will go forward and do it that way. Um, my email address was also included in the advertisement. So if you um, think of something later and want to be added, please feel free to email me there and I'll add you to this um, listserv only about deer on Cousins Island. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody here tonight, and um, and Karen, I appreciate the invitation here and the opportunity to discuss this with uh, with residents of of Cousins and Little John. And pretty much when this was first brought to my attention, you know, I certainly can't say I'm surprised. We do know we are in a part of the state that, um, well, some consider it a blessing, others not so much. But we do have a a uh, healthy, uh, productive deer population. In most places, it's not what I, we would consider an overpopulation, but it does require um, sometimes some, uh, some intervention to keep it that way. And over the years, there has been some modifications to um, the hunting seasons to allow for more opportunity in areas um, along coastal Maine, south coastal Maine, which tend to have the, the higher... Um, uh, deer populations, largely because of uh, our location, the fact that winters are milder. Um, in some of these areas, there may be fewer predators if you talk about higher housing densities. Not to say that coyotes or fox can't go through uh, your backyard anywhere. But sometimes deer end up having this refugia in places where there's um, more um, residences. So we're certainly... Um, used to that along the, the coast. And there is uh, certainly many towns that um, where we see harvests of, I would say, you know, an average of maybe about 130 deer taken per year during hunting seasons and some up to uh, uh, exceeding 200 a year. Uh, I know in Yarmouth, it seems to be that's right around usually about 130 over the last uh, year or two. And I think that's gone up. I think that's gone up. Um, there have been probably some additional people taking advantage of what's called expanded archery, which is our uh, season that allows people to use um, a bow and arrow. And sometimes those are you're able to hunt in closer proximity to uh, more developed areas. It's, it's sometimes better suited to that, in particular in places where you have maybe some restrictions on uh, firearms hunting or, or at least hunting with a, a long rifle. It's been a, a, a very much a benefit to allow us to manage deer in places that otherwise we might not be able to do so. And there's uh, many places in the country that are in that kind of the same situation where they're kind of conflicted of how to deal with, um, with deer. Uh, just to give you a little historic perspective, and I'm not going to give you a whole history of, of deer, but I want you to think back in around 1930, it was estimated uh, we probably had about 300,000 white-tailed deer in the entire country. It was an area that followed um, and a time when there was a lot of uh, mar market hunting previous to that. It knocked the population back quite a bit. Um, there was a lot of uh, farming or a lot of areas that were open to hunting, and, and um, the population was fairly, uh, fairly low. Um, right now, today, we probably have 
I mean, an, uh, probably an estimate of about 30 million uh, white-tailed deer in the country. So this is something you see in every place from suburbs of Chicago to Washington, D.C. to Long Island. And um, I think what we have learned as a department is, um, and again, I think others certainly are, are caught on to this as well, but what we try to do is um, encourage people to live with wildlife as much as possible, try to um, protect resources that they have in their property that might be uh, affected by deer. And um, there's certainly ways we can do that. There are hazing techniques, but really property um, protection, using fencing, using types of deterrence, uh, using selection of plants that may not be as palatable to deer. All these things are kind of put in a package can, uh, can help. Um, that is done in concert with trying to get as much opportunity for um, deer harvest during our regular season, uh, which is fairly lengthy, extends from September, I mean, essentially for September through December in your area. So, um, so as we have ample opportunity there, and I think that's what we're looking at. If there's places that still, after all that, um, does have problems on a case-by-case, -case, limited basis, um, we do have the opportunity to issue uh, permits um, if there's damage that is um, um, warrants that. Um, just chewing on a um, arborvitae out in the front yard is is probably not going to meet that criteria um, by my definition. But um, but if you there are times when we have to uh, we may do that mostly in agricultural um, purposes. I would say that. Um, there are places where we do actually do have more of a, um, a hunt that is uh, more of a managed or a special hunt, and it's important to note that those are places that often are um, offshore islands that are not connected by the mainland, may have um, more severe restrictions on the type of hunting that take place there, and those are places that if we didn't have some type of uh, hunting, and often it's uh, supervised by our office, then they really would have um, a potential of growing to a, a very high deer population. And that's happened in the past, so I think we're in very good shape with most of the Casco Bay Islands now, but I think your island is not in that same um, category. So I guess that's just a little bit about what, um, uh, just an introduction to the issue here. Um, I can certainly say I have been to the island a number of times. I've been out there, I'm aware of lay of the land, uh, some of the ownership of the land, some of the conservation lands there. Whenever I look at a place, I want to say, boy, is this a place that has a potential for um, hunting? Is this a place that, to me, by looking at the forest stands, does it appear as though there's been subjected to a very, very high rate of browsing by deer? That's normally something you can see. Um, and that's a kind of an assessment you make. It's very hard for me to say that on Cousins Island you have you know, 42 deer per square mile. It's, I know the numbers sound nice and we like to do that, but it's often very difficult to get an accurate um, density of deer. So what we've tried to do is, is kind of use uh, the public as a gauge of how many deer is too many for your island. And if there's problems, we can certainly intervene. Um, we have some uh, experience and expertise in how to do that and can offer uh, advice and certainly work with the town for you know, trying to uh, find a way to put landowners um, in touch with um, hunters and try to forge that relationship so that you can get some consistent pressure. So rather than going in and shooting a bunch of deer in one year, you really want to do it um, uh, for a sustained period. Keep that going from, from year to year is really what the solution seems to be. So I am happy to hear, I was told this was, a, again, a listening session, so I'm not going to be talking a lot. I don't plan on, on giving a monologue here tonight at all. I want to hear from you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to write down notes, so I apologize. I'm not rude if I'm writing down. I'm, not, I'm listening to you intently, but I'm trying to record this. And, um, and, um, it, and I'm fortunate to, to have uh, Molly here as well uh, from Maine Health. And we did, um, I did engage with, um, with her office and just um, let them know that we we're having this meeting tonight. And, uh, and she certainly could um, be a, a good um, resource for us tonight if there are questions as far as uh, uh, human health impact as it pertains to, uh, to deer, since that's something that we could have 
We could be here very late talking about that, so there's a lot we can say, but we'll try to be succinct in how we, um, how we handle that, but I know that's an issue that, that, that is often brought up as well, so we're happy to, to see if we can uh, shed some light on, uh, on that. So I guess with that, unless, unless um, Evan or Sean has anything that they wanna add, I guess we can just open it up to uh, the audience. And feel free to answer questions too as we Absolutely. move along. Absolutely, that's what um, we're so going to do. So numerous people have sent in emails to our town council or to our former town manager, Nat Tupper. Some may have already sent some in to the current interim town manager, Scott Laflamme. He is listening in online um, as well as a couple councilor, our town councilors are here. I can see their names on the board. I apologize for looking there, but I'd also like to recognize people at home if they did want to speak in. But we're going to start with some folks here. Um, if, even if you have sent in an email and you would like to highlight some of the points in your email, or if you and I have shared a phone call or seven in some cases, feel free to get up and um, just highlight those points because these specialists and professionals here with us tonight are the ones that really can give the back and forth that someone else may have been thinking or may be thinking or may not have thought about yet. And to get that answer out there tonight is really important. This is being recorded. It's also being broadcast on cable currently, and we will rerun it. So if you want to sit back with your cup of coffee in the morning and find out when it's scheduled to play again, you'll be able to hear all your answers. So we would welcome you to the microphone. Please don't be shy. Um, and just to um, Molly, is it meager? So Molly works for um, Maine Health Institute for Research in the Vector Borne Disease Lab. So ticks are ba basically a specialty is what I'm hearing. So just to give her um, her credentials and deserved um, attendance here, thank you. All right, go on up, please, please, please. Don't play. be shy. <laughs> thank you, yes. There may be a short line, but it will revolve through. Um, hey, Karen. Good evening, I'm Al Hickey. I live on Ebon Hill Road. I've lived there on Cousins Island since 1985, quite a long time. Um, always saw deer, but within the last five years, it seems like they've gotten much more prevalent. In the last two years, really prevalent. You see them all times of the day, uh, in the afternoons, not just at evening and dusk or early morning. I've got four of them, I think, that live between me and the house next to us, which isn't very far away. There's a buck and at least three to four other uh, females, younger ones, that I see commonly. Um, I think of the probably the health risk, too, with Lyme disease. But it's clearly different in the last, I'd say, two to three, four years. There's definitely been a large increase that I see. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. I'm Donna Felker. This is the third time since, no, fourth time since June that I've brought up the subject. And I'm so thankful that something has now progressed to this point. Um, I've lived on the island for about 50 years. And initially, um, the activity of the deer was very limited. Um, my husband's a hunter. I was a hunter. I enjoy seeing the deer. I don't enjoy seeing the deer now. There is much, much too many of them. Um, they're not afraid. They are, they are during the day, like the gentleman said. You can go out in the yard and they still stay right there. They're not frightened of you. Um, and it, you don't scare them. Um, and as the gentleman said, they do eat your shrubbery. They've never eaten my shrubbery before until the last few years. And I think their appetite has changed. <laughs> They enjoy a lot of things in my yard that they never looked at before. Um, my biggest concern, I think, are my grandchildren who play in my yard. Lyme disease is very serious. If you have seen a nine-year-old boy have Lyme disease twice, you may be concerned. It is a big hazard. We have no control over it out on the island, because basically hunting is not allowed. Now I know I've been told you can give permission to hunt on your property. I have a half an acre. So if somebody comes and hunts on my property but they can't hunt on the next property and the deer goes over there and drops, my neighbor is not gonna be very happy with me or the hunter that wounded that deer. 
So I think um, for us to come up with some solutions that's going to limit the herd and make it healthy for them and for us who live there would be very beneficial. Thank you. Please feel free to come up and share your stories, or if you've ever been a hunter on Cousins Island, we would love to hear that as well. Um, yeah, there are other people. Feel free to go right wanna, up to the mic, and we can certainly queue up. Do you want to? You want to take anybody from the, uh, the web meeting? Yes. Um, do you mind if we take one caller? Um, is it Baum, Mr. Bauman? Yeah, yeah, yep. ben, uh, ben Bauman. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. Um, glad to be here. Glad we're able to convene this session. I'm a, a resident of uh, Little John Island, and um, it's uh, you know we, we live out by the preserve there, and it's not uncommon for us to see six or seven deer at a time on a regular basis. You know, multiple times per week. Uh, we have two small children. Obviously, Lyme disease is of a concern. Uh, I pulled two ticks out of myself this year, pulled several out of my children. Uh, I don't believe we have a healthy ecosystem on, on Little John Island. Uh, most of the native undergrowth is not there, as far as I can tell. Uh, you don't see any native berries except for barberry. Barberry is the only plant that grows. <laughs> deers, deers don't won't seem to eat that. You know, it has thorns on it and everything. So for obvious reasons, they, they don't seem to like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe it probably has an effect on the greater ecosystem in terms of, uh, you know, birds, uh, you know, even other, I, I've never seen a rabbit on the island. We don't have coyotes. There are no natural predators as far as I can tell. Um, and of course, it's next to impossible to have any kind of nice landscaping. Um, so, you know, for us, it is a it is a concern at a number of level a number of levels, and uh, would love to see um, you know something uh, done about it. Thank you. Thank you. Ben was. Can I ask a question from the inner? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Catherine Gentile. I'm on Hillcrest Avenue in Cousins Island. Uh, and by the way, Ben was uh, calling from Canada. He's up there with his family now. The kids are on vacation. So uh, I was the backup. I have his email here. I was going to read it if he couldn't make it through. So I'm glad he did. Um, good news. We came this evening, and uh, we didn't encounter any deer on the way over. That's unusual. Uh, coming and going, uh, the island, they'll be along the side of the road in the woods, across the roads, uh, so it can be dangerous. Um, if you're not aware of the fact that uh, one deer is not one deer, it's either two or three deer, uh, you get into trouble. So uh, we were good this evening. We didn't have any problems. Uh, the vegetable garden's not growing right now, so they're not in my veggie garden. Um, they're not eating my hosta because they're not up right now. However, uh, I do spray, and um, I use a product called uh, Liquid Fence, which is non-toxic to animals, non-toxic to uh, humans. It's essentially rotten eggs and garlic. Um, however, uh, it requires precision in terms of actually spraying. So if they say every 30 days, um, I think the deer probably, I haven't, I haven't seen the woods, uh, any trees where the markings are, but I think the deer go in and they mark off when the old lady at the house, you know, out there spraying. <laughs> And when day 31 is, because if I miss day 31, they're out there. I mean, it is to the day. It's quite remarkable. So uh, the, whatever scent is left behind by that product, the deer pick up on, and they know when it's dissipating, which is quite fascinating. Um, not helpful, but fascinating. Um, we have been fortunate in our home not to have been bitten by ticks a lot, but this summer, I got a whopper of a bite and wound up on antibiotics for 21 days. And interestingly enough, um, I went to quick care, and the physician's ass assistant there told me, oh, you got rid of the tick, which I did. I took a shower immediately after I was working outside, found the tick, and got rid of it. 
And um, he said, within 72 day, two hours, you're okay. You don't need any antibiotics. And I said, hello. I said, I need antibiotics. And we had to advocate very vociferously to get a couple of antibiotics to bring home until I could contact my own medical practitioner on Monday to get a regime of 21 days. So there's a huge disparity in how our medical community sees this issue and how they respond to it. And as someone who has worked with people with neurological diseases, including and especially uh, persons with Alzheimer's, Lyme disease is a huge risk factor. Um, it's a huge risk factor, and it does not appear right away. So you can be bitten by a tick now. The spirochetes will stay in your blood system forever and ever and ever. And later on, when you think you're fine, you start to have memory issues. You start to have coordination issues. You start to have issues with judgment and reasoning. And, and we now have people. Uh, I, I'm running a support group here in Yarmouth. We now have people who are in residential treatment. Uh, and they have been there for 10 years. And one of the cofactors of their um, comor one of the comorbid conditions that they encountered in their diagnoses was Lyme. So yes, they had other factors that contributed to Alzheimer's. It's a multifactorial disease, but uh, Lyme was one of those. So that um, above the deer going in front of my car and they eating my garden and they biting us every once in a while and um, taking care of our pets, we have had pets that have been affected by Lyme disease, not us personally, but our neighbors, where they have lost a dog and they've gone out looking for the animal and found it collapsed in the woods and brought it to the vet and indeed the poor animal had Lyme disease. Now curiously, vets can treat animals um, with a vaccine, I guess it's called, and the animals get well. For some reason, we don't have that vaccine. So um, the animals are affected by it also. Um, but my biggest, my biggest concern is the neuro are the neurological implications of this disease and um, their longstanding effects. And I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to take Can I ask a in question person. from the internet or no? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for unmuting. I can see you now. If you could please just okay. state your name. Yes. Hi, I'm Mark Sheffer and I live on Seal Lane, which is um, in the Catherine Tinker Preserve. So we're kind of familiar with hunters using the preserve, I guess, as a base. They're not supposed to uh, hunt in the preserve, but um, a lot of times deer will run into the preserve after they've been shot and that sort of thing. Um, last year, I did have a, an experience of a, finding a dead deer on my front lawn with an arrow in it um, that I had to remove myself, which was actually pretty difficult. But aside from that, we also find um, pretty significant blood paths and entrails from people gutting deer and that sort of thing. So my point is, I think a traditional culling through hunting or an expanded season, because of the d density of the island population, might not work. I recognize a lot of the problems associated with having a dense deer population, and I agree with the risks of Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. I'm actually a retired physician, and I would recommend I keep a 100 milligram dose of dox doxycycline at home, and I take it if I find a tick has embedded on me. And I think there is some evidence that that helps to prevent uh, Lyme disease, so you can get one from your doctor. Um, but my point, again, is if we do engage in some kind of culling of the deer population, again, an expanded season with arrows flying or gunshots even potentially, and a fairly densely populated island, I don't think would work. So I, I think we might have to take kind of a, a unique approach to thinning the deer population. We enjoy seeing them, they're fun to see, but I think the medical risks are real. And uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you. We'll take another in-person 
comment, and then I'll go back to the internet. Hi, my name is John Honeywell. Um, I'm a longtime resident, actually a lifelong resident of Little John, along with several other people who are here tonight. And I just basically uh, want to echo what's already been said. Uh, the deer population has exploded, and it's it's pretty obvious to everybody who lives out there. Um, it's a lot of it has occurred within the last five years, but uh, it is very very noticeable and. For sure, um, you know, the, the, all the effects that go with it uh, are worrisome. Um, certainly the, you know, the deer tick population obviously is a concern, as others have already stated. Um, I would also uh, say that I can't believe when we get that many deer that the deer population is going to remain healthy uh, because it does seem like we're overpopulated. Uh, anecdotally, about two weeks ago, uh, I was talking to a neighbor right around sunset standing on the road on Little John Road, and he kind of, he was in his car, he kind of pointed over his shoulder and said, look, there were 15 deer in a row, single file, that came out of the woods on one side of the road and marched single file into the woods on the other side, 15 of them. Now, I've seen groups of six or eight. I've never seen 15 before. Uh, I, was, I was astounded. So I, I just think that uh, the, the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, that we have a, a hugely increased population and all the attendant problems that go with it. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can do something to, you know, create a healthy herd out there. Um, obviously, everybody likes seeing them, but we don't like being overrun by them. Thank you. Thank you, John. Is there anyone online? I see one person unmuted. Sally? Yes, thanks so much. Yeah, my name is Sally, and I do live in Yarmouth, not out on Cousins Island, though, but, you know, I actually... Um, you know, going to take a different tack than most people in that I really love seeing the deer and I do feel as a human very responsible for what's happening to them. There's, you know, develop land and there's uh, fewer and fewer places for them to, you know, they're really being, uh, you know, the lots of habitat is just a huge thing for deer. So I think it's just important that as humans, we think about what we're doing to the environment as a whole. And I understand that there's some issues that come with deer, but they are truly among the most gentle and tender creatures on the planet. And it just kind of breaks my heart that, uh, you know, me personally, I would love to see another solution. And just for us to, as humans, to really think about what we're doing to all the different species. Because, uh, you know, speciesism is alive and well. And as long as there's a pecking order filled with, uh, you know, as long as there's a pecking order among different species where we think we are the only species out there, uh, you know, there does tend to be a lot of cruelty and brutality, and I just think we really have to start thinking about uh, other species and the interconnectedness of the planet. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in person would like to? Yeah, please come up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lenora Felker, and I grew up on Cousins Island. And... Um, I have seen the deer population grow um, and become unhealthy for many of the reasons people have spoken about. But I also come from a family that was brought up um, respecting hunting and um, respecting that sportsmanship. So I think some of the understanding of uh, culling of the deer um, can be a little gruesome, like listening to the phone calls. I I know a few really, really amazing hunters that actually I've learned more this year about how hunters um, can actually take their game and will bring them to certain food pantries, So, which I didn't know about, and I, I can't remember the organization, but... It was someone that was talking to me and telling me about that. Um, I think that with the deer population so broad that I would, you can't move them like cattle, and chemicals are awful. And I honestly feel that um, us as a species, being humane to the deer and having ex experienced hunters in a, something that wouldn't, harm houses around and using that that procedure 
to thin the herd, but also using that meat to feed our community. So I think there's more to it for Maine. I mean, this is a New England thing. Um, to understand the hunting process and to see it as not a gruesome slaughter, but as an opportunity to thin the herd, to make it healthy, but also to feed our community. And it doesn't have to be gruesome. If it's something that you're uncomfortable with, I, I suggest talking to someone that hunts and does it well and is an experienced bow hunter to know um, how that can be done humanely for the deer population. Thank you. Mike I Gentile, I live on um, Hillcrest Avenue on Cousins Island. I have a question for the panel. What is a sustainable level in open ground for uh, our a per acre? Okay. I would say right now, your estimated densities of deer in south coastal Maine, and again, the caveat is, it can vary considerably from one part of the town to the other. If you've got subdivisions in all places in, in one peninsula and there's no hunting at all, you're going to find that often considerably higher than you will in an area that is more wooded and there's just going to be maybe a lower density of, of deer. And the un other important thing to remember is deer that live in closer proximity to human development they're often going to have much smaller home ranges. They're able to do that because there's generally more food available to them. Sometimes it's the food that we plant in our yards that we get from the nurseries. Uh, sometimes it's our gardens. Um, but often their home range uh, in inland Maine, you know, maybe as much as you know, three or four square miles or so where they spend most of their time. But if you are in a part, one of the towns along the coast, that deer may not go too much farther than, you know, 40 acres in the course of a, uh, its lifetime, really, sometimes. Depends on the season. So you have a much higher um, likelihood of having higher density. So I would say in coastal parts of the state, it's likely that we have deer densities around um, I'd say a minimum around 20 deer per square mile. Our management goals for deer supposedly is right around that 15 to 20. Um, if you per are square per square mile, if you are further in, inland Maine, you are looking at densities that can get as low as about uh, one to two deer per square mile if you're up in the St. John Valley in the Allagash. So it varies considerably. But that 20 deer per square mile is for the region itself recognizing there is much variability between there. And if that, if Cousins Island is about, correct me if I'm wrong, about two square miles, Little John probably a little less than half of that, then it's conceivable that at the minimum you would be expected to have probably about 40 to 50 deer would not be unusual to have on Cousins Island. And it's likely you could have um, potentially even uh, more than that, because one thing that we do have to remember, and this has been shown in, um, in some study sites where there are a known number of deer in a captive situation, and they, the, the contest, the test was, well, they were going to have people give an assessment of how many deer they saw, and they walked through a 200-acre fenced-in pen, how many deer are you going to see? You're going to get your eyes on many fewer deer than are actually there, so there probably are going to be more. They can be fairly furtive. You certainly can see these groups of 10, 15, doesn't surprise me, not unusual. Females will generally gather with their offspring and they'll form doe groups. Um, and that's very typical during the winter time. Um, males tend to be a little bit more solitary, but you can find those, those um, doe groups and they can get, sure, it's not unusual to find 15 of them in one place. So I would say, yes, you, you would be in that neighborhood of maybe having uh, 40, um, you know, 50 deer. But again, that is not a precise measurement. That's what I would uh, probably expect you have. What deer can, your, your other question is, your follow-up is, 
what is a good population for a deer? Well, that figure that we look at as far as that goal of you know, 15, 20 deer per square mile on the high end, that is kind of more of what the um, cultural carrying capacity is going to be. In other words, what people are going to tolerate as far as the deer population. If we weren't here, what could deer do? Deer could very comfortably live at densities over 60 deer per square mile, 80 deer per square mile. They can do so. Um, you don't start seeing really um, density-dependent health factors uh, affecting deer and fitness factors affecting them until really you get you know, over 100 deer per square mile, actually. So, so we actually can, you know, we, always, we often say, well, it's, it's hard for the deer when you're in high densities, they're going to they're gonna suffer, they're not, they're not doing well. And yeah, it may be situations where some of them do get pushed out of feeding opportunities, but actually they are very, very resilient, they are very adaptable, and they can live pretty well at, at high densities. We will not tolerate them at that level, though. So that's the difference between biological carrying capacity, I'd say you start to hit that threshold, yeah, around probably 60, 80 deer per square mile or more, and our, and our, and our cultural carrying capacity is probably down around you know, 20, 30. That's when you start hearing comments about, I see too many deer, they're all over the place, I can't grow a maple tree in my backyard, um, I got, I, they're feeding on all the, the plants, we're having more road um, vehicle deer collisions, those are the kind of things that seem to happen at that cultural carrying capacity. Uh, we had a, a meeting very much like this one, uh, a lot of hunters, a lot, uh, about hunting at Pratt's Brook, and the, the answer was about the same then. That's 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure. Is that about right? Yeah. And um, uh, what I noticed about it was that Pratt's Brook is not an issue of, wasn't an issue of Lyme disease or uh, eating your bushes, that's a park. So, um, and it had a, it had a re remander clause in its contract that we had to give it back if we cut off hunting, so that stopped that. But, uh, it, and it made sense because it was the place to hunt, it's open ground to the part where they hunt there. Um, no houses around it. There are houses there, but not close to where they hunt. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of hearing what I hear today is that we're in the second case, the case you described for Cousins Island Little John. We may have 40 deer, but it's too, many, too much for the density. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's not likely to happen. Yeah, sure, yes. No. Um, okay, no, I, I'm sorry, I was just answering another question. Sure. No, I, I, certainly, um, I certainly can understand that, and again, that is something that People have to make that assessment of what what you think a high density is. I mean, they they again they do very well. I would say it's important to look as far as the bigger picture. I know not everyone is in favor of hunting. Some people are. They understand that hunting has a very important role. They don't want to do it themselves. That's fine. I can get that. So there's differences in how people perceive it. But if you're looking at the larger solutions to how you control a deer population. Um, certainly one and the preferred one, one yeah. and the one that has the precedent across the country actually of working is going to be hunting to some extent. Um, sometimes you liberalize that and you get more and it all depends on site specific. There are some places you can tolerate, some places you can't. Other options to consider and again, these have been thoroughly researched, they've been tried other places, and they've been um, assessed of, of whether they're viable options, and that would be trapping and relocating deer. Um, that, has, that has been brought up, and there may be very isolated situations where that can work, and I'm thinking if you're an island and you are um, you know, 10 miles offshore, let's say you're Montinicus or Monhegan or something like that, you're gonna have options that you're not gonna have on Cousins Island because there's no immigration and emigration of deer to those islands. They're generally, they are gonna swim a few miles. They can swim um, you know, several miles deer in the, in the ocean. They're not probably not gonna go 12 miles out in the ocean in, in any numbers that's going to sustain that as some of those other islands would be. So trapping, relocation, 
is not really a viable option in most places. It often is expensive to do, labor intensive, can result in certainly some mortality of those deer you'd capture who you feel like you're doing a great job, but really sometimes it does um, subject them to some stress and some of them may, may die from that, of course. And um, So that is the other option. The other thing would be some type of uh, immunocontraception and um, that is something that has been tried in places. And uh, sometimes, again, if you are in an area where you don't have as much connection to source populations of deer, we do. You got Freeport, you got Cumberland, you got Falmouth, you got mainland Yarmouth, you got all these towns all over the place. They all have deer. So whatever you do on Cousins Island, whatever you do to those deer, it's just a, it's a they, they, they're coming from, from, from here as well. So it's, it's not going to be solved, whatever you do on Cousins Island. That's nothing for a deer to travel. So immunocontraception is not something that is an option. There are different ways that it's a surgical way of, um, there are some ways you can do it for male deer and some ways for female deer. Both of them have been tried. They generally are not considered really a viable option except under very unique circumstances. So, and the other thing, of course, the other big picture item is learning how to live with them, responding to them, trying to experiment and uh, employ things like uh, electric fencing, uh, physical fencing, woven wire fencing. Um, and again, as was brought up um, earlier with the, uh, um, with the spray that Ms. Ms. Gentile brought up, those are very good. There's been agricultural research stations across the country that have dedicated time and whole research studies to experimenting capsaicin base repellents with, um, I know it sounds terrible, putrescent egg solids are the two primary types of repellents that are put on these things. And sometimes you can buy them in hardware stores, but often you can make them yourself for a lot cheaper. You can, you can do that. You can make this stuff yourself, and there's, there's recipes all over the internet. Some of them are better than others, but they're all basically about the same. That can work short term, as said, they often will wash off in the rain. So if you have a small hedge you have a particular interest in and you really like this particular type of plant, then um, that's something you may be able to do it. If you have a half an acre of plants and you have thousands and thousands of dollars of landscaping on your property, then no, I probably would not go out with a backpack sprayer and think that's reasonable it to works. go put that My on all the time. I'd put up but a fence. Be on the day, but... Yeah, I'd put up a fence is what I would do. <laughs> Fences work, there is probably nothing better for protecting your resources than a fence. Is it a big initial investment? Yes, relative to other options. Is it something that is, is worth it? Yes, because it works 24 seven, generally 365 days a year. You don't have to be there. You don't have to haze an animal that comes in at 2.12 in the morning. Um, it works all the time if it's done correctly. Um, you can either have a physical fence or you can have one with electrification on it. You can have electrical fences that are very small and you can, if you have something half the size of this room that you want to protect, just let's say your garden, just so you can have your garden for um, four or five months a year and you don't want them on it, you can do that and you can put that up and those are very economical. Um, you just, the fence charger is the biggest part, but that's something, it's an initial investment and it basically is going to last for 20 years plus, so they're, they're, they're good products. That can be done. I would also say that, and I can leave some of these for you, and maybe I can follow up um, with Karen for getting something on the website, but we do have, and we frequently share with the public, um, lists of plants that are rated by palatability to deer. And these, again, the people who research this, they, they're not just anecdotal, they actually look, okay, how often a deer feeding on this particular plant? And they list them as um, uh, severely damaged, rarely damaged, um, or uh, frequently uh, damaged, and there's different, different levels of that. Some the deer don't seem to touch at all. So some of the ones they don't, they don't touch at all may not be as flowery and attractive to you, so I understand it's, it's maybe some of your favorites would be something that the deer like as well. But for some of, some of um, these plants, it is like putting out candy, um, and, and the deer are going to come and take that. So you've got to consider, do you really want to put um, $4,000 of landscaping 
into something that is going to be highly palatable to deer when you're living in a place with a you know a, a high deer population. It's probably it's probably not the best thing to do unless you are going to have some level of protection around that, and likely that's going to be um, some type of fencing. So we certainly do have these lists um, that we can share with you, and um, that's a good that's a good guide. So I don't know, sir. Well, Did that answer your question, or yeah, partially. Uh, one of the final questions is: I think everybody would agree that they don't like their their plants eaten, but I don't think that's the worry here. I think people are telling you the worry is Lyme disease, and you can still have Lyme disease without deer, but it drops dramatically, is my understanding. And uh, I got four friends that have had it for thirty years, mm -hmm. friends. So you know, it's. It, that's the big worry. It's a public health issue as far as I'm concerned. So we need a solution that will work in the short term, not a fat long term. So. And, and Molly, I certainly invite you, this is your specialty for sure. What I would say to that as far as just my involvement in it, as it pertains to deer, the important thing for people to remember is that deer certainly do play a role in the life cycle of the black-legged tick that does carry Lyme disease. That tick has a life cycle that early on in its life cycle is going to feed on generally rodents and other small mammals. That's where it does pick up the bacteria that eventually gives, will give you Lyme disease. The role of deer is that it provides a food source for that adult tick so that she's gonna latch on to that deer and, and the, the larvae as well. They will also have blood meals as well. But that, if you have um, deer, that is going to be generally a preferred host for this tick to latch onto, get a blood meal, and then she is ready to drop her ticks, um, her eggs, excuse me, in the spring. So it is something that there is a connection, and deer do play a role in it. They're not the only role, though, and don't think that they're not getting it from uh, deer, and deer don't get Lyme disease, but they play a role in the life cycle. But I can also say that and from what I understand, in some surveys that have been done along the coast, it's, it's been fairly consistent, and, and Molly, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I can remember in, in over the years, it seems as though the surveys that have been done by the scientists and, um, that are researching ticks, they found that probably about close to 50% in that kind of in that neighborhood along the coastal zones, and all the way up to the mid-coast, and the mid-coast seems to be about more of a hot spot right now even than, than here, as I understand. So th th there's, there's a lot of ticks that have that there, and I, I don't think that this is something that is going to be within the region, and it's not some panacea that I have that's going to say, well, we're going to get rid of deer, or we're going to drop our deer population down by 60%, and it's going to get down to, say, less than 10 deer per square mile. And at that point, the, the literature seems to suggest that deer are less effective at um, supporting the ticks that will give you Lyme disease. So is that a reasonable goal to get down to 8 to 10 deer per square mile? Really not, to be honest with you. I just don't see how that can happen. So it's something that I think we are going to live with to some extent. And the best things that we can do in that is you can do some landscaping around your yard. You can do things to modify your site so that you're less likely to come in contact with them, less likely where you say your grandkids going out and playing, well, where the swing set is, where the sandbox is. If you have a lot of um, brush down there and you have a lot of um, high-density regenerating plants, that's what you want to kind of clear out. Um, sometimes just putting a strip of either wood chips or crushed stone in a perimeter an area that you want to exclude from ticks. Not going to keep them all out, but it's going to make them harder for that to travel three um, feet over something that can dry them out. They really don't seem to like that <clears throat> traveling through that very well. So there's certainly things that, that you, can, you can do and also our own ability. And I know it's difficult because these things are small and the larvae are very small. It's not like a dog tick or the same as a wood tick where you can see it and you know it's on you. Sometimes these black-legged ticks or deer ticks, as we're also known, they can be quite small, but it really is something that you should consider. Um, repellent, there are some very good, effective repellents on the market. I understand some people don't like to spray stuff on them, but you can spray it on your clothes as well. 
And the other thing is, is just getting, uh, doing a good tick check, difficult to do. These things can hide in nooks and crannies. You can't see everywhere, I understand. But those two things are something that we really sh need to get in the habit of doing. So, I mean, I, it, it, I understand the concern, but that's... Well, I'm just, I'm thinking about it. They have gotten areas down to that. I mean, I, I understand your thing about the, the islands, but there were deer last year on Monhegan. They got them off again. <laughs> they killed jump. every deer on that island. Mind if I jump in? Oh, please. please okay. Um, I, I'm just going to jump in. I, can yeah, I sure. speak? Um, yep, I I'm, so, I'm sorry that you're online and can't see. We ha also have a line in person. Um, I see that you're signed in as Janet. I will uh, call you out in just a moment, but if you could remain on mute just for or anyone online, if you could remain on mute, because there's a lot of feedback yeah, in this. I just in, would like to comment. Yeah, we would love for, to hear your comment. If you can yeah, hang in there with us. I need to say. Thank I you. Said what I Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, just as a, a follow-up, we, we definitely want to hear from everybody that wants to say something, and we'd love to keep it going. We, I'm taking more notes than I should um, in the sense of length, so these will all be available as well, but definitely Lyme disease. Um, the concern about um, other other deer interactions, whether it be vehicle or eating plants, it has been a uh, recurring theme. Um, we would love to hear more about numbers. Uh, we would love to hear more about interactions. Um, police reports have not shown um, many. Two is enough, I guess, in one year between car and deer that was reported. So I'm wondering if there are others that have not been reported. Um, where maybe you were able to drive away and the deer ran off, or you didn't need the PD to come over and make a report. Th that information would be, gr I would be grateful to hear that. Um, if anyone has that, would love to share it. Share it by email if you don't want to say it tonight. Um, also, I, I think hearing the various, um, the spectrum of palatability for solutions can be all over the place, whether you want to save every deer and every white tail out there because they're cute, or you want them all gone because you want to be healthy and safe and whatever that might be. So please, um, if I can um, have everybody respect the various opinions, we are, we're trying to find solutions that are going to, we are hopeful to find solutions after this meeting as to what might work for this small community. Um, Cousins Island and Little John is very, two small areas of Yarmouth. Deer are considered an issue in various parts of Yarmouth, but we want to help so badly. So please provide us your comments. We're going to do our best to listen and take more info and hopefully come up with possible solutions. Hunting might be one of those for some of you. Hunting may not be for others. So we're going to do our best to make everything work. Thank you. Yeah. Can I put you on the mic so people at home can hear? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ahrens. One minute. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, just, I would say one thing to definitely keep in mind when considering this is um, a holistic approach of um, integrated pest management or integrated tick management. Um, so if you're going to consider something like a cull or a reduction to also consider other measures as well. Um, so we consider a cull to be kind of like a long-term measure um, considering the tick's life cycle, it's two years, so you're going to see it's going to be most likely a couple years before you're actually seeing a reduction in ticks and tick-borne disease cases. Um, so in that way, you would also want to consider habitat management or manipulation as well as maybe spraying or um, other tactics. And I did bring some resources um, for maybe modifying your yard or if you'd like to see some studies about some deer densities um, and how that might affect um, disease transmission or just tick abundance generally. Um, you can either give me your email or I can give you a copy of it. So come and see me. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mr. Ahrens. Good Your evening. Uh, my name is Phil Ahrens. I lived, my wife and I have lived on Cousins Island for 50 years. Um, I do think that there is an abundance of deer right now, but over the 50 years, the deer population has varied. It's high right now, but it has been high before. It's just something, it's just sort of part of nature that's happening, I think. Whether it's going to stay high, I don't know. 
there are predators. There are there's a very significant population of fox on the island, and they have chased deer. Um, we happen. We we live early on the island, um, but and and near open space. Um, we enjoy seeing the deer. We've not had a problem with them. If we see deer in the backyard, um, we open the door. They take off right away. Uh, I'm surprised at that. I'm I can I hear it and and I'm sure it's happened. But um, the deer still are not um, pets, as you will. Um, the one thing that I would encourage here at the at the end of this is for first of all for IF and W and the town to continue to work together on addressing the concerns that you've heard. I think it would be enormously helpful rather than relying on uh, anecdotal evidence is to have some scientific count, some way to find out what the population of the deer is on the island. I, I like the term of the cultural density because I think that's different than what the natural density is. And it may be that People on the island are more sensitive to overpopulation of deer, and maybe that has an impact. If you do decide that something needs to be done, the one thing I would ask as strongly as I can is that it be done uh, exactly the same way that it was done out on Peaks, is a professional comes in and culls the herd. I'm very nervous about a number of, and Lenore, I'm sure, that that your friends are very very good hunters but i think it ought to be done through ifnw determining the number of deer that ought to be culled and i know that on peaks that that food went to, to food markets um our food pantries and that's exactly what ought to happen so let's find out that let's find out the numbers let's find out the science behind it do we need do we have too many deer uh how do we do that over some period of time, and then what's what's the solution? And if it is to reduce the population, I would encourage a professional culling. That's it. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. I'm going to jump over to Janet online. I think it's listed under Janet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, completely agree with Phil Aaron's. Um, I've been on the island. My name is Randy Melvin, and I live on the island for the past 30 years. You know, we've been dealing with deer. Uh, when I had dogs, they stayed away, and now my uh, yard is pretty much a salad bar for the deer. But I really don't mind that. But I saw just a few months ago 14 to 16 deers in the woods behind my yard. And what concerns me with the growing, with the warming of winters, the deer ticks are not dying. And we're getting increasingly more deer ticks and people on the island are getting affected by that. And so I think it's not an, an elimination of the deers, but just calling it down so it, li it limits the amount of exposure we have to deer ticks. Um, I think Peaks Island did a tremendous job of uh, not, not eliminating the herd, but just calling it down so it's reasonable because there's no natural predator out here for the deers. And I think we, we need to consider the um, people on this island's health um, because the deer, I mean, the deer tick population is exploding. So I just wish that people would consider that in the same way that we were bombarded by the uh, brown um, tail moth and the, and the town responded to that. That's no longer an issue for us, but now the issue becomes deer ticks and the Lyme disease that they carry. That's, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melvin. Uh, just as a, a heads up for that conversation, yes, Peaks Island is a, um, 
a highlight for the professional culling or whatever the term is used. Um, that was at a cost of eighty to one hundred thousand dollars to do so. So, where brown tail moth is also in my back pocket, and that was twenty thousand. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Please. I'm Karen Saucier. I live on Maplewood Avenue and have lived there 46 years. So I think I, the only thing I would really like you to hear tonight is that most of us have spoken, have spoke, have all lived on the island for 30 to 50 years, and I think that's the big difference. Is this so? There, even though Chip may say it's it's gone up and down, I've never seen this many. And drive the accident. Uh, incidents to me, I drive very differently when I come down the hill to the bridge and across the bridge and all the way to Maplewood very differently than I did 20 years ago. Yes, I'm older, that's part of it. But no, I'm just so cautious because I know where those beers, uh, deers cross. So I think even though you're not seeing accidents, I think many of us, because we are aware, are very cautious and drive much slower um, and in the legal speed limit, um, but just because of that. So I think that, you know, take that into consideration about why you're not hearing about accidents is because or excuse me, we're aware and we're more cautious. But I think the difference of, you know, they used to eat my tulip bulbs. So yes, you don't plant tulips anymore, but now they eat everything. And and yes, I spray and I use egg yolk because it's way cheaper than liquid fence and it works really well. So there are lots of things to do spray. But, you know, the health issues, um, I think those are some of the important things to think about. And I, I got up here because nobody had mentioned Peaks Island. I wanted more information about the culling. I mean, I knew they had hired a sharpshooter, but I didn't know anything about how they reached the numbers and how they knew how many to cull and so I, I was helping for more information and you've given us some of that but to me that seems like a really good answer is to cull it professionally get them down to where they might have been 20 years ago and yes they may go up again but you know something how to manage that that's all um, I'm just going to jump in too because I hear a lot about hunting and our town does a really nice job collecting permits and having people register um, if you are interested in hunting uh, we work with numerous hunters um, who want to hunt in our open spaces. Um, the ones that come through our office, I would classify as more responsible because they come and they ask ahead of time um, about certain properties and permissions, and um, they're very eager to hunt and, and eager to follow the rules to be responsible in that case. Um, just going to throw that out there as well. Okay. Hi, I'm Mark DeSell, uh, resident of Yarmouth, uh, and an avid bow hunter. Um, years ago, I was hunting in Yarmouth on a bitterly cold December day, and I'm very good about checking after I've hunted, and I went in to shower up, and I noticed something on my back, and then I looked in the mirror. It was an embedded tick. So I took it off, as I've done numerous times, and you send it in, and they'll check it, and they'll say it's an adult female. You have to keep your eye on it, talk to your physician. And I talked to my physician, and I said, it's December. It was freezing out there. I can't believe that I got nipped. And he said, Mark, they've adapted better than cockroaches. <laughs> and, and he was right. So now... I, I'm very, very good about checking. I went to Swans Island um, in October to hunt out there bow hunting. And the friend that I was with, we came in, and we both had three ticks embedded. So we were taking ticks off. And I said to him, you've got to go back when you go back, and you've got to get doxycycline and, and have your doctor give you that. You have to take that, you know, so that it prevents the Lyme disease. And um, I know I'm hearing, you know, people talking about hiring a, you know, a professional to come in. I'm from the standpoint that I'd like to see more opportunities as far as hunting. I, I had mentioned that I hunted the Tinker property many years ago, and now it's closed to hunting. And I remember hunting that property and being up in a tree stand and watching a lady go by with a golden retriever. And I said, I'm not going to see any deer. And five minutes later, I had a deer walk by, and I thought, you're kidding me. I'd like to see those places like the Tinker property and maybe some other uh, property down there opened up and expanded um, maybe past the expanded season. Have hunters that take a proficiency test, you know, for being able to hit at 30 yards and 20 yards. I don't take a shot that's really any more than 30 yards. It's mostly... 20 yards when I when I do shoot. 
Um, but I'd like to see expanded opportunities and not baiting and having a sharpshooter come in and, and killing the deer. And I, I agree with giving the meat away. That's, that's hunters for the hungry. I am all about that. But I, I would like to see more expanded opportunities. And homeowners, if you have a problem, I'd like to help you with that problem. Let me know. I'd love to come in and hunt. Um, and I'm an ethical hunter. Uh, I've been doing it for 30 years. I absolutely love it. The only problem with the expanded season is I don't get any sleep. <laughs> so I'm hoping that we'll see maybe more opportunities available to help, you know, with the numbers on, you know, Little John and on Cousins Island. Okay, and and I can just follow up on that point is that in speaking um, with Catherine earlier on this, it's one thing that came to mind is, and again, as a as a as a wildlife as a manager, that's one thing we 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 do look at that as a very viable option that is the preferred option and has a track record of being effective. And I think what we would try to do is to try to find some landowners on Cousins and Little John who may be open to having hunting on their property but may not know how to reach a hunter or may need some um, convincing on uh, measures that are taken to ensure a very um, safe hunt. And that is something that we do have some, um, I think, very, very um, effective laws at doing. And certainly Warden Franklin can explain, uh, can expound on that a little bit about as far as um, distances uh, from discharge of, uh, of an arrow from uh, houses. And, um, and I would also say that um, Sean Campbell is a, a, a very, very competent um, bow hunter. He might be able to explain a little better um, about some things that, that he looks at when you go into a situation where you may be hunting in, in very close quarters and um, some of the considerations and, and how it's, um, it can be effective to get um, people on the landscape. And it generally is something that we really have very little, if I'd say no, disruption on landowners. I mean, I think you can feel safe um, and you generally would have an opportunity for reaching out, meeting your hunter, talking to them, and um, any details you want to exchange on how to use the land, whether you're home or whether you're away for the um, fall season and you want to extend it. That's certainly, there are some options up there. But what we have found is in places like this, when you have areas that generally are not hunted, the deer seem to very quickly understand that those become refugia. And you may have one point of the island, and I know there's some I've been engaged with, with um, one of the hunters in particular that works on, on Little John, and he's in close, close communication with the landowners who specifically have them come in and hunt, and it's been a consistent effort, which is very, very important. And um, that is something that you really want to, to do. You foster that relationship with them. And if you just have some consistent hunting on this particular point and everything else, maybe except for the power line, is, uh, is something that people are hunting and that's, that's it, then these deer are, are no. dumb. They're going to they're gonna key right in on that. And they're going to say, well, I'm going to stay right next to this house. I don't have to worry about coyotes killing me. The people don't do anything. They maybe open a door, they scream at me, they rattle something, rattle a pan, uh, shoot something in the air, but they're not really doing anything. So they don't have any reason to be concerned about you. So that's why they're not running away immediately. It seems as though they're not kind of growing up with that association that there's potentially um, reasons why they may want not want to be out in the open when there are people around. I mean, most of them are going to have that that tendency to kind of leave us. Um, and that's something that doesn't happen as often in these developed areas. So that's what I would say is we could even work with the town on trying to find a way to um, establish maybe a, some type of registry where um, 20, 30 landowners say, sure, I'm amenable to having some um, hunting on the land. 
let's go over it. Let's see where they can where they can go, and um, and you put that hunter in contact with that landowner, and that's I think would be your best first step. Um, and I'm happy to. Um, I know the question comes up about the professional sharpshooters, and certainly I I don't want to, to dominate the night with that, but I would say that I do have some experience of how that happened on Peaks Island, and I, I do still engage with that today as far as maintenance hunting out there, and that's something that we have a, a, a process in place to continue that. It's not like um, the sharpshooter came in and called um, 200 deer. They were put to very, very good use, of course, and then he's gone. Um, that's only effective because we have the annual um, uh, consistent pressure out there. And Peaks were a little unique in that they had what really was a very high deer population. And for me, you, I know you folks live on the island, and some of you maybe disagree with me, and, and, and I, I'm not claiming I know as much about the deer population as anyone here, but for the times I've been out to look at it, it hasn't jumped out at me as something that I'd say would have been analogous to what was observed on Peaks and what was observed on Monhegan when they got to that very critical level where they said, okay, we got to get, we got to get the big guns in here and hire the professional. And he's a very professional person. I do know, I, I know him, I'm aware of his company, uh, the very good reputation. Um, and again, that's, that's, that's something I would say is just, I don't really think that you are there yet. And I think there are other more conservative approaches that we could take that, um, you know, as, as, as Molly was mentioning, kind of a holistic approach, multiple things we can do that I think would be um, allow you to reach your goal. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in two years. You're not going to not see any deer. But it's a progression towards uh, uh, the direction you want to go and try to limit that. Um, and again, it has to be done consistently. You're adjacent to areas where there are other, you know, average to high deer populations, and uh, and you have to have that done very consistently. And we work to do that in all communities, not just Cousins Island, not just uh, Wells Reserve, where we also have some type of uh, additional um, hunting pressure as well. We really had to make some additional provisions for, for hunting out there. Um, it happened in all these these different communities, but uh, I don't think you're at the that level where um, a sharpshooter is going to be your your viable um, option. If I could say one more thing too is, you know, we used to talk about a hard winter, and sometimes that would cull, you know, deer herds down, that the weak wouldn't make it through and the strong would survive. But we don't have that anymore. We're having warmer winters. The animals are able to make it through the winters with really no difficulty at all. Um, is that going to continue? I think it's going to continue with the warmer winters, and it's making a difference where they're they're not, you know, susceptible to harsh winters and and cold temperatures and whatever might call them that way. So I think that's something that has to be taken into consideration is is climate change. Yep, and and again, that's something that we, we have been um, assessing winter conditions for many decades. And we would be doing it at what we call winter severity index stations. And it was a really cool thing because we got to visit these sites every week during the winter and measure the snow, measure the deer sinking depth, kind of take a rough assessment of how deer are wintering in a particular deer wintering area, a wintering yard, which, which um, you know, we, we had designated and we had, you know, stakes set up. So we had something very objective we could use to measure that. Um, and in so doing, we would certainly come up with a figure called the Winter Severity Index. And certainly, um, Cousins Island would be in that area. It would be amongst uh, the lowest winter severity indexes in the entire state. So it's correct. Um, you can expect a certain number of deer to die as your winter severity index increases. It is, um, it's more pressure on the deer. It's, um, it's kind of, they have that threshold of um, time in the spring where did they really save enough in the fall for calories and fat and are they going to make it through the winter or not? In some parts of the state, you get to that point in April and it's a, it's a very tenuous line and sometimes they really don't make it. It doesn't seem to happen as often 
and in this part of the state, and with your close proximity to the ocean, that is generally not something that's going to be a very, very significant um, cause of mortality for you. Not to say it doesn't happen on occasion, but it's from a management standpoint and a population standpoint, it's going to be much less of a factor than it is in any other part of the state. Thank you, Scott. For your time. Okay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Tim Davern. I've lived in uh, Yarmouth for about 25 years and not coincidentally have been a bow hunter for 25 years uh, for a reason because the population uh, in this town uh, is, is pretty healthy. I don't live on Cousins Island, um, but I have a couple of uh, points I'd like to make, and I think Mr. Lindsay did a great job of summarizing my five-point strategic plan for you. I mean, you nailed it, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, the first point is that, you know, according to Mr. Lindsay, you probably have 50 or 60 deer. Well, let's say that, let's say that that's conservative. Maybe there's 75 deer. The second point is that something's changed, right? According to most of you, something's changed. Uh, and I don't know if that's environmental. Maybe uh, Mr. Dissel is correct that it's, you know, partly uh, easier winters. Uh, maybe more of you are planting uh, succulent greens and, and producing salads for them in your backyard. Um, but my experience locally has been that the biggest uh, variable that has changed is a lack of awareness and understanding of uh, hunters and what they can do to help you. Uh, I'm a hunter, so I'm going to be a little bit biased when I make this point, but I can tell you that 10 years ago, I could approach a home and say, geez, do you have a problem with deer? And they'd say, oh my goodness, yeah, I have a problem with deer. Would, would you like to hunt? Now I approach a home and oftentimes the answer is, well, yeah, we've got a problem, but I don't want to upset my neighbor. Yeah, we've got a problem, but as Mr. Bowman pointed, I don't want to find a dead deer two houses over on the lawn or in their pool. I don't want to upset my neighbor. I mean, it happens, right? So there's a lack of understanding uh, uh, about the need for hunting. Some things change. And I would argue that perhaps there isn't as much hunting uh, in the area because there is a fear or there is hesitation or there is anxiety around upsetting your neighbors. So <clears throat> I'll make a few points about hunting. Bow hunting, uh, you know, hasn't evolved a whole lot in like 2,000 years, right? It's still killing a large mammal with a sharp stick. That's, that's it's, it's not an elegant ordeal. And when you shoot a, an animal with a sharp stick, their cause of death is bleeding, right? They're going to bleed to death, so they're going to travel a little bit. And I, and I bring that point up because I've encountered a lot of homeowners who have said, well, geez, I had a hunter here, but he wounded a deer and never found it. And that is part of part of the sport it is hard to find an animal that has been shot and had to bleed to death and that doesn't sound very nice it's not appealing and it's not for everybody and i would make the argument that a lot of people don't want to be a part of that but there are a lot of hunters like myself mr dissel and probably others in this room uh, who will take it seriously and do it responsibly. So I, I think my, my last point is, if you could, as Mr. Lindsay said, collaborate with your neighbors and come together to, to, to have an agreement that you're willing to have a handful of hunters, even if they just killed 20 deer, and five men killing 20 deer is not a big ordeal. That is not going to take years and years and years to happen if they have the cooperation of neighbors who support the effort. If they support the effort, then hunters can come in, do it responsibly, take their time. They can track the deer, find the blood trail, recover the, deal, the deer. And if you're in agreement to not harass the hunter if they have to come back the next day, if you're in agreement that, yeah, sometimes there's going to be some loss, Sometimes you don't recover the deer. If you're all on the same page about trying to reduce the herd by even 15 or 20 deer, you may be able to, over the course of a year or two, really significantly impact the herd without spending $100,000 for a sharpshooter to come in and do it. At the same time, you're providing a little bit of sport and a little bit of the history of Maine right, to harvest 
whitetails, feed some families. Maybe they're willing to donate. We donate. You know, there's plenty of places to donate. There's a lot of people in need. I'd make the argument that you, if some of you could get together and, and come to an agreement on those terms, that there are some really fine hunters out there who are willing to do it correctly, and it may not be perfect. You've got to be a little bit forgiving that it may not be perfect, but they'll do a good job. And uh, I, I would be open to that idea before I would jump to the Peaks Island solution uh, for seventy-five, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars for sharpshooters to do it. If Mr. Lindsay's estimate is correct, and you have fifty deer, that's exaggerated to seventy-five. If you take twenty out of the equation, you may get to an environment to a cultural level that is acceptable. So I hope that makes sense. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. And if I, and if I can just expound a little bit on what Tim said so so well, um, it's for many of you may not know is is Cousins Island is within what we call an expanded archery zone hunting for deer. Those are areas we have several throughout the state, and they are very very important, and they are strategically delineated as areas that um, have some limitations on hunting, uh, the type of weapon that can be there, sometimes high, high, higher housing density. And those are places that are specially designed to allow for the additional hunting opportunity for does. So it is not like in most parts of the state where you get one deer and that's it. Um, with expanded archery, which runs from, again, about September, early September, through um through December, um, into early December, so it's a long season. That is a time when you can have additional harvest of does. Now, if you're trying to um, manage a population, it is much more beneficial to target the harvest at the does because again, one doe, um, if it's a yearling or older, it's going to um, have at least one fawn a year, sometimes multiples. In southern parts of the state, we tend to be a little more productive, so there's probably a higher twinning rate in, in this part of the state. So you can very easily see that if you have that opportunity and one particular hunter says, well, I have, uh, I, I work nearby, I can get out, I can arrange my schedule during that time expanded archery that I can get on that stand and I can hunt, and I may be able to get seven or eight does a year. Um, that is something that they have the option to do in expanded archery. So that is a very, very important additional tool that we have instituted through hunting to address places like this, and it can be very, very effective. The other thing that is happening, and I can just give you an update on another um, weapon that is um, in the play now and is becoming more popular, and that's a crossbow. Um, currently crossbows um, as an alternative to um, a compound bow and, and long bows are sometimes used. Um, that is an additional weapon that uh, can now be used in the expanded archery zone. You cannot use it to take deer that you are listing as expanded archery. You cannot get you know the three or four, five plus deer, however many you really want to put um, to, to add on to your, um, to your bag. Uh, you pay for each one of them, but that's the way it works. And um, so, but it's likely, it's possible, I should say, uh, say possible, because it's not my decision. It's going to go through rulemaking, and it's currently gone through um, this legislative season. I think it'll be considered, and we may have an answer by April, is um, crossbows may be able to, excuse me, um, um, yeah, crossbows, you may be able to take deer as expanded archery deer with a crossbow. So basically, it will give a hunter a chance to say, well, I can take a compound bow or I can take a crossbow. For some, it is easier. Sometimes for older hunters or smaller people who are smaller in frame, it might be easier for them to operate a crossbow versus a compound bow. They are extremely accurate, um, and it's something that uh, I think people are getting more popular uh, with them, and we do offer that as far as our safety um, programs now, showing people how to use them and how to use them proficiently. So it just adds another tool to the toolbox between that 
in the expanded season, these are things that are kind of uh, going to work to your benefit. And I guess one thing I would just ask for the people here today and the people online, can I just have at least a show of hands? I'm just curious to, to see if there's any way we can talk to you. Concerns about having a hunter on their property and maybe some questions you have about it and how we can kind of answer that. I'm, I'm sure Warden Franklin might be able to answer and put some of those concerns um, and address those, but I'm just curious how many people would have some concerns about hunting and wanted to ask some questions about, um, about that. Are we talking about guns and bows, or just I don't even know what's allowed? You are, yeah, you currently, correct me, you are allowed, you're allowed bows now, and you're allowed shotguns on, shot, no, no shotguns, just, just bows. In some parts of the state in that zone, you're allowed shotguns only, but I think it's just bows. So, so we're talking about how would you feel about having a bow hunter on your property and those that have concerns about that? And just as a reminder to our panel too, um, the Cousins Island has some larger tracks of private homeowners and some very close small tracks. So I don't know if that inventory is going to help necessarily, but feel free to answer his question with the hands. Um, so there are st certain streets that are very, very close. Um, and then others, Hillcrest is certainly on the top of my mind thinking about that, but then there are others that do have acres. You could feel like you're not even in Yarmouth. <laughs> and again, I've spoken to hunters who have, and again, they've doing this, of course, <clears throat> with permission, fully invited on there, but I've spoken to hunters who said they can basically hear um, uh, ruckus in the kitchen in the morning, everyone getting ready for breakfast, going out and getting the kids out of school. It, it, that, that's how effectively it can be done close by. <laughs> Um, Sean has done this before, and he goes to even to other states to do it as well. He has experience with it as well, knows how close you can you can get in there um, without, again, causing disruption. You're often in an elevated um, location, so that, that can't help. You don't have to, but there are certainly um, some ways that that can be done that is going to be even possible in a, in a fairly confined place, albeit... There are certain places where it may not just be suitable to, to, to do it. Certainly there are some of those situations, but I think there's less of those places than you may think. We live in an area where a lot of cats and mice So the question for those online um, is how responsible is the property owner uh, in a small neighborhood where the deer was shot on one and ended up on another? Did I summarize that okay? Yeah. Okay. If you could answer that. Thank yes. you. Uh, so there's no responsibility to you, the landowner. Um, as this gentleman stated earlier, these things happen sometimes. And uh, a responsible deer hunter, uh, after shooting a deer with an arrow, will wait... 20 minutes, half hour for that deer to hopefully go just a short distance, lay down and peacefully expire. Um, occasionally in this area, I've been in this area for 15 years, uh, I deal with a deer that went somewhere that it, it shouldn't have and the responsible hunter usually approaches the landowner and says, hey, uh, posted sign or not, I'm tracking this deer, it's on your property, may I? Um, usually those issues resolve themselves. Very, very rarely do I have to get involved um, where the deer is essentially property of the state and I need to go retrieve it because it went somewhere that the landowner is really upset about. Um, but generally with just good vetted hunters, um, those situations resolve themselves. Thank you. We do have someone at the mic if you don't mind. Hi, Lewis Holmes, Tidewater Lane on Cousins. Um, I won't belabor the numbers that we have. We have 12 deer that were there consistently in my yard all summer, not just a winter yarding thing. Uh, a nice four-pointer, six-pointer, and eight-point buck as well. Um, and they're still there, so I'd love to have people hunting anytime. Um, it's also really done a number on the undergrowth, as other people have said, and that's having a big impact on all the other species that would live there. 
Uh, I would just ask that as being completely in favor of more bow hunting, there were lots of bow hunters this um, fall, which was great, more than there were last year, or at least more than I ran into. We invited some people we met to come to our property, but uh, be nice to have some way of connecting. I'm not sure you're going to have a hunter dating app, but you know, something <laughs> that would be the equivalent for people who are interested. And we're leaving our emails here for... Yes, thank you. I've done a speed dating for babysitter needs. We can do it for deer hunters. Exactly. I'm okay with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. I lived on an island since 61. Never saw a deer except at one time when you saw their footprints. 2000, you start seeing them. Last two, three years, explosion. My hydrangeas out front barely get a little bit of green before they're stripped clean. But we did everything, like you said. We've got wooden fencing around the backyard, invisible deer fencing around the vegetable garden, grass is no higher than two inches, front yard is stone paving with wood chips. Doesn't stop them from coming up to the house, bumping because they got an itch or banging at the door at 10 o'clock like they did last month in a queue to try to get to the Christmas wreath to eat it. And that was kind of funny. But um, <clears throat> deer hunters, haven't seen any for 20 years around our property. We're on Madeline Point Road. Seems like it's deer central. They come down the road in front of the house. They come down right behind it from that field, cross this way, cross behind me. Any given time of the day, I can look out there 15 is a low number. Like the gentleman said, there'll be three or four bucks. Accordingly, there'll be the ladies that will be there, several teenagers, a couple of kids. I'm out there watering the guy with the hose. doesn't stop him. I'd love to see some bow hunters, but you got next era right across the street. No hunting. And that's where they're coming in and out, and they got a huge area. I've walked those trails there. Any given day, you'll see them there. So um, I have the house sprayed twice a year. Uh, it used to be Lucas, now it's Davy for ticks. Last two days, very next day, I pick up a tick right on the patio. And I'm dressed like I'm in a hazmat suit because I'm out there cleaning, the, and I haven't even started to clean. And I will end up, they'll get underneath a cuff, mm -hmm. back of your neck because they've climbed up the clothes, even though you've got everything tucked in and you spray to high hell. <laughs> you stink because of it. So what can we do if we get bow hunters? They can't go across the street. That's where they're living. They're be that's where they're betting. I've seen them betting behind my house or across the street. And my neighbors will tell you, 15, low number for us on any given day. OK, that's a good question. And Thanks I can so just, my, my an answer for that or would be, I think you are correct as far as the large landowner at the um, end of the island, uh, next era, I believe it's total, I think it's about 150 acres or so. It's quite a bit they have there in addition to the, the power line. I, I'm thinking it's going to be very difficult to provide any opportunities in there. I have attempted to reach out to them. I've contacted people down in Juneau Beach, Florida. I was referred down to down there. I got no answer, no one, I could not talk to anyone, they just wanted to know my account number. It was just very difficult to, to reach. <laughs> so if anyone, I'm sure maybe Catherine or someone in the, in the, Karen in the island, or if there's someone on the island that has a local contact, I'd be happy to at least engage with them on that. But again, I think considering the security issues they have around a large power plant, I am thinking um, it's going to be unlikely to get anything there. What some comments I did get from the time I've spent in the islands and speaking to a couple hunters who have hunted the, um, the power line, and I understand there's trails through there, is they, they have commented that uh, one thing that does um, probably reduce their chance of success on there is the, um, the kind of the loose dogs. And I understand people walk the power line, there's a trail, and um, and I know you take your dog out for a walk along there, but that is one thing that you know, at least during the during the season when they're out, um, that has been something that has caused uh, 
you know, often dear to, to flee and complicated things a little bit. So I, th that's not something that I have any, um, I guess, control of, but I think any efforts to um, certainly keep your dog, I mean, you can't have an at-large at dog, but, but even if your dog's close to you, if you can keep it on a leash um, with you, I think that would be preferable to having them run quite a ways uh, uh, off, uh, away from you, even if it is under technically under uh, voice control. So that's the only thing I would say as far as your question's on. Uh, but I'd be happy to, maybe I can get some contact information for um, the next era, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have high hopes on it. We have it and we will we'll be making okay. a call. Please step up, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name's uh, Joe Vinson. Originally, I wasn't going to speak, but after hearing some of the testimony here, I decided to. Um, I've been a bow hunter all my life. Uh, as I was a hunter and sa safety instructor for the state of Maine. And for years, um, I live on Little John. I've we've been, you know, plagued with deer. I kind of enjoy seeing them because I certainly don't see them where I go hunting. <laughs> and uh, having being a bow hunter, you realize that even a good shot, the deer isn't going to drop right where you shoot it. It'll probably go 50, 100 yards, even if it's a good shot. So this year, uh, there's more sentiment in the neighborhood about people being disgusted about deer. And one of my neighbors who owns not a big parcel of land, but he says, you got to do something about the deer. And I said, you know, always hesitant because of that factor that the deer travels and what if he dies in a neighbor's lawn or something like that. So after coming back from hunting camp and not seeing anything, living like Jeremiah Johnson for a week and walking 50 miles, I decided I was going to give it a shot. So I sat out in my backyard and I was fortunate enough to be able to call um, not one but two deer in. Actually, I called deer in three times. One time it was before legal hunting and I couldn't even see it. So the other two came in and uh, I shot them and um, stayed back for about 45 minutes. One of them circled back and died in my compost pile and the other one died in the neighbor's yard. So it was kind of a successful harvest and when I told my neighbor that who where the deer expired, that I shot it there, they were saying, oh, yeah, any time or, you know, that type of thing. So there's enough sentiment now that hunters are um, a little more welcome than they used to be. So, so that's my two cents. Thank you for the humor, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also just add very quickly on that, for a case from Peaks Island, very early on in the early 2000s, there were many people who were opposed to the annual um, hunting efforts out on Peaks Island. And um, they were very vocal about it. And they were certainly, their opinions were considered, listened to, and tried to work around that. After approximately 20 years now, 20 plus years of doing that, some of those very same people who were opposed early on have come to, um, I wouldn't say necessarily be a big fan, they're not lining up to us or bringing us up muffins or anything like that for people who are out there, but they're at least uh, to the point where they've understood the value of it and they see the place of it and the benefits of that. So it's something that people's opinions have shifted um, a little bit. And again, they, so they don't want to see as the deer killed. I, that's, that may never change, but they kind of recognize that it's something that um, they at least um, understand it happens and they're in favor of, um, of the effort. So that's maybe something that, uh, in other words, the point is they thought it would be a, um, a kind of a chaotic scene with the hunting occurring out there, even at the limited scale that it is, but it really hasn't, has very little uh, impact on them. It hasn't caused any disruption. People still go out, they walk down to the beach, they walk along the trail around the island, the kids go to school, out on the bikes, and everybody's doing everything, and it's uh, still all happening and, and everything's still good. So just something to, to remember. It really doesn't change the way you're going to live on the island by having some additional um, hunting presence out there. Thank you. Mike? 
Hi there, I'm Ann Thayer. I live on Little John, and I live on one of the small parcels, about four tenths of an acre. I have hosted um, hunters on my parcel who successfully took out three deer over the year, three or four deer over the year. Um, one of the things that you asked for was about um, uh, conflicts with vehicles. Uh, I have hit a deer. It was over the border in, in Freeport. Um, the, uh, the police wouldn't take a report because it was there was minimal damage to my car. Uh, if I were to log all my near misses on Cousins Island and Little John, I'd probably have about a dozen over two years from, um, you know, hitting the brakes on Cousins Island to I actually have to get out of my car and throw rocks at the deer to get them out of my driveway when I come home. So um, they're pretty... Uh, and, and so, so along that lines, um, uh, I also I put out game cameras and I share that information with some of the hunters, bow hunters that I know that are on Little John. Um, what information would be useful to gather or what can we help gather uh, with regard to either um, the traffic hazard question, uh, the numbers question? It, it is not unusual for me to pick up the, the herd of 16 or um, a dozen uh, just just with uh, my my cell phone um, and I'm just wondering if if that is useful information for you for us to gather and report in some manner to help with kind of decision making or or coming up with planning does any of that help you at this point? I mean, uh, the, certainly the statistic of uh, vehicle deer collisions is an index, mm -hmm. which um, which is uh, data which is collected. Now, on the statewide level, um, DOT collects that, and basically that is going to be the ones that are going to hit the bar for being reported, though, are generally going to be collisions where there is vehicular damage, enough that's going to warrant you to call your insurance agent and try to get that um, fender, or used to be fenders, the plastic molding, which costs a lot more than a fender used to fend, to get that fixed in your car. That's something that generally is going to be um, reported, and, uh, and even DOT does collect this information, and they contact our office fairly regularly saying, you know, we've got a report of um, a half-mile stretch of road where there's been uh, five reported um, car vehicle, uh, car, car deer collisions over the last year. Is that something that you think warrants putting up a sign? So it is collected, and it is an index, and it is kind of an index, too, of, of deer density. I mean, when taken into consideration what your road density is as well, um, that's, that's important. That has to be um, calculated in there. Um, but it is very it is important to know. It's kind of just so, so yes, your question is that would be one index that we could use. Okay. Jim Kelly, I'm in gray. I wish I had this deer problem. But uh, <laughs> I'm an animal damage control agent through the state, licensed through the state. So any of you guys that have small property that are concerned with the hunting or whatever, um, I'll leave some cards up here. You can call and give you different, you know, methods to keep the deer out of your property. Some work, some don't. It's the, hunting's probably the best option, but there is, a, there is other options. Just for those ones that are nervous about the hunting. Thank you. Hey, Karen. Yes. Hello, ITM. Come on at us. This is Scott Laflamme, Interim Town Manager. Hi, everybody. I just want to first thank everybody for taking the time to be here and the panelists for um, for really sharing some insightful comments and, and being open to the conversation. I do have a question, though. So in the mid-2000s, where I grew up in Old Town, Marsh Island was going through a very similar pro problem. Um, and again, historically, firearms were not allowed. And the deer population got to a point where they were causing a lot of vehicular damage. Very similar concerns that folks are, are sharing now. Um, Marsh Island had a very, again, very similar constraint in that about 60% of it was owned by the University of Maine, which didn't allow for any, um, any hunting. And so uh, there was an expanded archery season, which I think they collaborated with a, I think, I think the acronym was like BLIP, B-L-I-P. 
um, that were sort of in sort of an enhanced certification of bow hunters that were proficient within sort of a, a, a longer distance and really kind of calm the fears for folks who are worried about having stray arrows um, in their backyards. Can you, can you, is that still a thing? Um, and I'm just kind of curious if you have any other information about that type of certification or those types of hunters who are available who might be able to do sort of a targeted um, expanded bow hunt. Um, so the blip program is really no longer um, an active program. It was kind of a partnership, correct me if I'm wrong, through Maine Bow Hunters Association. Um, I've recently tried to rekindle that. Um, I'm very early into that process, but I've, like I said before, I've been here 15 years. I've had this conversation with people on Oars Island, um, six or eight different places of just condensed, built up, a lot of food, not a lot of hunting pressure areas. So as the local game warden, I'm trying, um, like I said, I'm in the very early stages of trying to come up with some way that I can have a list of vetted hunters to partner them with specific landowners that want to use uh, hunting as a method of wildlife control. So um, in a short answer, my um, phones, they never go, they never stop. <laughs> um, the short answer is it's, it's not currently open, but um, it's something that I'd like to revisit. He might beat you to it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I was gonna, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, good point, Karen. But I, I appreciate the feedback and would, would really love to hear more about that if it, if it comes to fruition. So appreciate your time and thanks for being here. Yeah. One thing I would just say before the night closes is uh, I live in Brunswick. I've been here for quite a while now. Um, if you have specific questions about law enforcement as it pertains to hunting, um, I'll get some cards at the end here. Call me if I have to come down and meet with you and your neighbors and brainstorm together on the possibility of allowing a bow hunter in your specific area. I'm happy to do that. Um, as a rule of thumb, we manage by take. People buy hunting licenses. The hunting license pays for wildlife conservation in the state. They pay taxes on their hunting equipment, which comes back to us through federal monies. Um, that's the big game management wheel that, that we generally operate in. And if I can help um, a specific hunter on a specific piece of property, um, you know, we have all summer to work that out before this, this coming year. So I'm happy to come down and do that, go through some ideas. Um, for those of you that aren't really familiar with bow hunting, it's really up close and personal. Um, most ethical bow hunters don't shoot more than 30 yards. Um, you can talk to most any bow hunter more than a week into a season and they're like, well, I saw this, this great deer, but it was 50 yards and I just couldn't shoot it. Um, so they're generally in a tree. They're generally shooting down. It's a very up close and personal hunt. And if you want me to come to your property and, and look that over and, and give some personal advice, we certainly have time to do that before next year. I just wanted to throw that out there before things wind down. Thank you so much. Do you have a comment? I, well, I, I said I was going to ask you about the bow hunter landowner programs that I was part of <laughs> 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I went through that with uh, my bow hunters association. I think I had my name on a list by now. We're going to hand you a mic. Sorry. Which, yeah. Which, Don't push which, the button. Which I believe that put my name on a list for the town. So if anybody had issues with deer, they could go to that list and then call up and, and get a uh, bow hunter who's already been vetted or, or pre-screened. I never did, never got a phone call though, so. What, what happened, just curious, as a member of Maine Bow Hunters Association, what happened to BLIP? Because we did work with them in the past and it seemed to be just a, a very effective program. But. Well, I think maybe setting up the program was pretty straight ahead, but somebody still, uh, a member of the public still had to find a list online and then be comfortable calling a scary hunter person that they'd never met, regardless of being part of a accredited program or something. I, I think that's the biggest thing, making that initial introduction. Right. Great. We're lucky to live in a small town. Hopefully that can help. Hmm. Do we want to pass a mic? It, it, so it, it's difficult. We still have about 10 or 12 people online. It's difficult for people at home to hear what's being said, whether or not they couldn't get here because they were out of state or, or other mobility concerns. So if anyone has anything else, that microphone line is really short. So otherwise, we'll, uh, if you don't 
head to the mic, we're happy to wrap the evening up and uh, some of the town staff and town councilors and volunteers with our parks and lands committee will uh, put our heads together to sort of see with our state guidance what might be the best path to moving some solutions forward to making more people more comfortable in their backyards or front yards for that matter. Irv Telker, I live up on Hazard Island, Hillcrest. Just talking about the car yeah. the collisions. I've never hit one, but I, I can tell you as soon as I cross the bridge, coming home, I'm on the lookout. And I'm looking way up, and I'm get to the point now where I see the shadow go across one of the reflective signs, and I'll usually turn on my four ways. And I'm waiting for the second or the third or the fourth. And and that's, I was talking to somebody that drives for the uh, Shabig Island bus, and he drives at night. Once 9 o'clock comes, he says, I see him every night out there. But I, I if it's this time, I go home tonight, as soon as I cross the bridge, I'm on alert. And uh, if you're following me, you're following, you're driving the speed limit. <laughs> And but but it's amazing though. I, I would say every third or fourth time, if I'm out this time of night, I will I will see deer. I have not seen a collision though. Yep. I'm gonna put a deer shadow in my neighborhood then to slow people down. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Felker. There are only three. Camp Sosi, uh, so there are three public acres, is what was said from the audience here, um, owned by the public or owned by the town. So we have uh, Camp Sosi, which is just under five acres or just around five acres. Um, Tinker Preserve, which is the Catherine Tinker Preserve right at Seal Lane intersection with Cousin Street is um, just about seven, seven and a half, I believe. And then Madeline Point, which is, um, you've heard from people on Madeline Point Road, but near the end of the road there with some parking available along the side. Yeah, so just speaking on Cousins Island. Um, and then Little John, Isle, Little John Island does have the, the preserve and some other public town-owned property. The preserve is not town-owned. Um, it is owned by Royal River Conservation Trust, but there's another op partnership opportunity potential. Um, and then the small acreage that the town owns scattered throughout Little John, very small. Yep, so that's owned and managed directly by um, Royal River Conservation Trust. Mm -hmm. And I would add that adjacent to that, by the way, there are um, some landowners that have had a history of engaging with um, a hunter, and I've spoken to the hunter and we had a very good conversation, and it works out very well. So that is something that we hope can be replicated. Not right now. Not right now. Yep, so none of the properties that are on Cousins Island are currently open for hunting. Well, and that, that that's only, you know, 20 or less acres, considering the entire size of the island. So the town is something, I mean, this conversation is going to give opportunity maybe there, but it is very small in comparison to the other hundreds of acres that are out there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that goes. As you see, public meetings draw out a lot of um, comments. And if we were to open Tinker, we'll see how that goes. Uh, that will go through the town council. Um, it'll, it'll, there'll be a process. It will start at um, the Yarmouth Community Services, be recommended with the support of Parks and Lands Committee, and then make its way to uh, other public meetings at council if that were if anything were to change, and that's any of the parcels that could be owned, that are owned by the town. That's why we start now. <laughs> it takes a while. Good question. All right. Yes. Do you want to go to the mic? Do you, would you mind going to the mic? Thank you. When Prats Brook 
uh, was first being talked about as far as um, the uses. There were people, of course, on both sides of the fence, people that um, didn't want hunting and people that would like to hunt. So I remember one person who, unfortunately, in the conversation was very abrupt in the way he was approaching the subject. And I remember talking to him during a break and saying, you can't approach the subject the way that you're doing. You have to educate. You have to make these people understand that this is what we do. And then things changed a little bit. And actually, hunting is allowed mm -hmm. on Prosper. And I was actually a coach at the time. And I, I mentioned to the people that were against you know, hunting, I said, I would have no problem bringing my, it was a middle school cross country team and having them run the trails because I knew that anybody that was probably hunting in there would be bow hunting and would be an ethical hunter and it wouldn't be an issue. I really didn't fear that at all. Um, but that was a, it was a, an educational process that needed to take place to make people aware of this is what we do, this is how we do it. And I think that any of the landowners that might be against hunting, um, maybe there's a way you could work with them, you know, to talk to them and say, you know, this is what will happen, this is how it can happen. Um, uh, but it's, it's an educational process. I've had one person stop me in my coming out I'm next to my truck, and he pulled up, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I just was bow hunting. He goes, would you like a new area to hunt? And I said, wait, nobody stops and asks me that question. And he goes, no, I'm the caretaker of a very large parcel, and we have a problem. You know, would you like to come up and, and, and take a look at that? And I did. Um, and now we're friends, and um, they've got some issues with other things like geese, but <laughs> but it's all part of the process. What's that? Um, you just brought back 18 months of my life of public meetings at the Prattsburg Park Management Plan back in 2016 and 17. Um, yet yeah, parts of Pratt's are open to public um, fur hunting, and it's shotgun and bow hunting in that property according to our firearms ordinance um, and according to the deeds as separate properties were um, given to the town over the years. So we have, um, we have it very clearly marked with our now a slightly larger staff with the time to go tree to tree every however many yards to mark the parcels that are available to hunting and not. Um, and you'll see that probably at Tinker as well. You'll see many signs that say no hunting. Um, but yeah, typically bird and deer hunting are the traditional um, hunting at Pratt's. Uh, we do post at the trailheads. We post throughout the property boundaries. And then within the, pro the larger property, we also post where there is no hunting. If you're coming through the woods into a, into a part of that park, um, and we do host two cross-country meets every year there. We host one for the high school and one for the middle school, typically before hunting is allowed in there, but sometimes the dates are a little earlier. Um, but but it's it's well-marked. And typically in the, the conversations during that period of life um, <laughs> that we had, uh, many hunters came out and said, we're, we're gone by daybreak or we're gone just after daybreak and people don't even know we're in there typically or right before the end of the night. And by then, cross-country runners are not running the trails. So we work with all of our agencies to make sure our properties are as safe as possible and, and post it as well as we can. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right, just a quick thank you to our state staff for spending a very long evening with us here in Yarmouth. We appreciate your advice, your guidance, any paperwork. If I can take a couple copies of those, I'll upload those on our um, town information. And um, if you haven't added your name to an email list, please do, or email me separately, and I'll put your name on the list uh, this week.
Thank and you I do much. have hard copies for pickup if somebody wants to leave with a list of uh, plants that are preferred by deer and others they don't like. 